First of all, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today uh, with you. This is a fantastic program that the organizers have put together. And uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, uh, the gut <laughs> uh, just before lunch. Um, I want to emphasize that this is your session. Um, and so I want to welcome you to intervene and uh, ask questions during my presentation. I really have no big agenda here. I'm just going to try over the next few minutes to introduce you to a little bit of where the gut falls into uh, the allogeneic stem cell transplant process. So I won't just be talking about chronic graft-versus-host disease, but also about acute graft-versus-host disease, uh, again, involve, and infections involving the gut. Um, so with that, uh, you know, the topics, we'll talk about what is graft-versus-host disease and how can it manifest in the gut, what other kinds of things can um, uh, also mimic graft-versus-host disease, a little bit about syndromes of acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease as they pertain uh, to the GI tract uh, treatment and uh, then promising new agents uh, in development. So any time that we transfer cells from one person to another, unless those two people are identical twins, there's going to be an immunologic reaction that occurs between the two. Now, with the preparative chemotherapy and or radiation that we use, we typically are pretty good at preventing the host versus graft reaction, or which we call rejection. But what we're talking about today is the opposite of that, and that is the reaction of the donor cells against host tissues, um, which can uh, uh, occur really at any time after the transplant. Most of the body's normal tissues can be um, targets, but the most common ones are the skin, the GI tract, the liver, and the lungs, and the mouth. Now, when the donor immune system attacks the tumor, we call that the graft versus tumor effect, and that obviously is something that's beneficial and really accounts for the power of this um, uh, strategy for treating malignancy. Um, so the goal here really in, in when we do a transplant is to strike a balance between the aspect of um, the graft versus host reaction that we want and the aspect that we don't want. Now, the risk of graft-versus-host disease really um, relates to lots of different factors. Here I've listed a few, the most important of which is the degree of matching between the donor and the recipient at sites on, that we call, at genes that we call the HLA uh, genes. And what we know is that any time that we're transplanting across a barrier in which there is mismatch between the donor and the recipient, it really requires that we do things that are beyond the ordinary in terms of graft-versus-host disease prevention. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. The risk of GVHD also uh, depends upon the prevention strategy uh, that we use. Stem cell source, so blood stem cells, for example, have more T cells in the graft than bone marrow, so there's a little bit more in the way of graft-versus-host disease. Cord blood um, can also be used as the stem cell source. There, there's a little bit more plasticity. So what that really means is that we can transplant across a little bit more of a, a, a barrier in terms of mismatch and still get an acceptable outcome. Turns out age is an important factor as well, both in terms of the donor age and the recipient age. So there's a little bit less graft-versus-host disease when we use a younger donor. Um, but uh, there's also a little bit more graft-versus-host disease when we have an older patient. And the other point about older patients as opposed to younger people is that younger people tend to come off of their immunosuppression completely more rapidly than older people. And children in particular tend to come off very quickly because their immunologic machinery that's there to re-educate those donor cells to become self um, is more robust. Comorbidities of the patient really also play into the risk of graft-versus-host disease because we know that the sicker the person is going into the transplant in ways other than their cancer, the more um, likely it is that we're going to have to deviate from the tra original transplant plan. And when we deviate, that's when the risk of graft-versus-host disease really goes up. <laughs> 
And then donor gender also affects the risk of graft-versus-host disease. We know that this is the one thing that men do better than women. <laughs> so all other things being equal, we will pick a man over a woman as the donor um, unless the woman has never been pregnant. Because when women are pregnant, they're exposed to non-self antigens, and that seems to allosensitize them in such a way that they cause a little bit more graft-versus-host disease when their cells are used. Now, the management of graft-versus-host disease really begins with prevention. And for every allogeneic transplant that we do, there is a planned prevention strategy that's either going to that's going to fall into one of two categories. Either we're going to use medications surrounding the transplant to prov to suppress the donor immune system as it's adapting to being inside of this foreign host, or we are going to engineer the graft in such a way that we're going to eliminate cells um, that, are, uh, that are likely to cause graft-versus-host disease. I think it's fair to say that both strategies are a work in progress in the sense that we have not completely effectively prevented graft-versus-host disease and at the same time maintain our anti-tumor effects of the graft. I think graft engineering is a little bit less far along in terms of identifying ideal strategies, but one of these two strategies um, is, is always going to be a part of the transplant plan. Acute graft-versus-host disease is the, the syndrome of graft-versus-host disease that occurs early after transplant, usually in the first 100 to 150 days after the transplant, although, as I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes, it can present later. This is the kind of graft-versus-host disease that the patient can typically say, and if you all, those of you who are patients know this, you can say the day that it started. Okay, I woke up on Monday and I had a skin rash, or I woke up on Monday and I started having diarrhea, um, or I woke up uh, and, and my eyes were yellow. The first line of treatment uh, for acute graft-versus-host disease is corticosteroid therapy, and those patients that either don't respond to steroids or that uh, are not able to be tapered from their steroids have a distinctly less favorable prognosis than those who are able to sort of come in, get the steroids, and then um, uh, be tapered off rather quickly. Chronic graft-versus-host disease, on the other hand, usually but not always occurs after day 100. It often presents during the time period when the immune suppression is being uh, tapered but it can present really at any time in the first couple of years after immunosuppression is discontinued. So what that means for, for me as a transplanter and for a patient is that you can't just say, okay, they're off their immune suppressive medicines now, we can say goodbye. I continue to follow those patients closely, whether it's in person or at home in the form of uh, guidance for their doctors because graft-versus-host disease can occur fairly long after you come off the medications themselves. Now, chronic graft-versus-host disease is much more subtle um, in terms of its onset uh, and much more diverse in terms of the kind of symptoms that it causes. Sometimes it can be something that you may think is so trivial, like, well, my hair's falling out, or my skin and my nails are just not the same color that they used to be, or I'm losing weight and I can't explain that. And chronic graft-versus-host disease is much more diverse in terms of the organs that it can affects as well, including organs that are that that can be quite serious, like the lungs, the kidneys, the peripheral nerves, and really any tissue in the body can be the target of chronic graft-versus-host disease. Again, the first line of therapy for uh, patients with chronic GVHD is steroids, um, but from there, optimal treatment really depends upon the person, it depends upon the manifestations of the graft-versus-host disease, and it also depends upon mundane issues like how far away from the transplant center do you live. Um, what's your access to uh, uh, different kinds of medical care and monitoring. Overlap graft-versus-host disease is the third sort of category, and these are patients that have features, clinically features, of both acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease. So they might have scleroderma, skin involvement, but they might have 
um, diarrhea um, uh, as a manifestation of more of an acute uh, picture. This generally occurs in the same time period as chronic graft versus host disease and is considered a type of chronic uh, graft versus host disease. Now, as I alluded to before, a little bit of graft versus host disease is a good thing uh, if, you, uh, if you have a malignant disease, that is, um, because it reduces the risk of relapse of the underlying malignancy. And here you just see that patients who had graft versus host disease had a lower risk of relapse, really about half the risk uh, uh, of those who had no graft versus host disease. Now, that having been said, graft-versus-host disease is a continuum in terms of not only the manifestations, but the severity. And in studies that have been done, what's consistently been shown is that the people who do the best after transplant are, pe are not people that get no graft-versus-host disease, but they're also not people that get a lot of graft-versus-host disease. It's those people that manage to be fortunate enough to get just a little bit. Those are the patients that are the most likely to survive the transplant and not have relapse uh, of their underlying disease. So it's really striking that, that balance that's the hard part uh, here. So with that, I'm going to sort of shift gears and, and talk about the GI tract. Um, Technically speaking, the mouth is part of the GI tract, but I think there have been other sessions that have focused on the mouth. So I'm going to start just below the mouth at the esophagus, which is kind of the conduit to uh, the GI tract, which leads into the stomach, uh, which is kind of the, the place where things get churned around and mechanically and biochemically broken up. The small intestine is the primary site where nutrients and things are absorbed, and then the large intestine is the place where the stool is really formed into sort of a solid mass and then uh, excreted uh, the other end. So I'm gonna, we're going to follow a patient and uh, 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 through the various iterations of uh, uh, graft versus host disease. And the first scenario, it, it's, it's always going to be the same guy, 40-year-old man with a history of AML in remission who's had an allogeneic transplant from an HLA-matched unrelated donor. In this scenario, he's 41 days after his transplant. He, after getting back his appetite after chemotherapy, um, he develops sort of the secondary onset of nausea, anorexia, and vomiting. His infectious evaluation is negative, and he has endoscopy and a stomach biopsy that's consistent with acute graft-versus-host disease with no evidence of other, uh, of other problems. Upper GI graft-versus-host disease usually presents early after transplant. This is not one of the forms that typically presents later on as a late acute onset. It involves the stomach and sometimes the very proximal uh, small intestine. It presents, as this patient did, typically with some degree of nausea, anorexia, and sometimes vomiting at, at a time beyond the point when the immediate post-transplant GI stuff that you're all probably familiar with should have worn off. There certainly are other things that need to be considered, particularly infection and medications as alternative explanations. But I think the important point here is this is a type of graft versus host disease that's fairly unique in that it is extremely responsive to steroid therapy, both topical and systemic. And so this is a very good type of graft versus host disease to have. Um, uh, and it typically responds uh, to even to, to much lower doses of steroids than we have to use for some of the other uh, types. Now back to our friend, the, our 40-year-old guy. In this scenario, he's 50 days after his allogeneic transplant, and he presents with a new onset of voluminous diarrhea. And here I'll just put in a pitch. You know, we do so many things in the course of the transplant that I think people really find humiliating. And one of them is when we ask them to um, quanti to, to save their, their poop and their pee. <laughs> um, but in this sense, in this type of scenario, that becomes really important because we gauge how sick a person is and how they're responding to therapy by how much 
diarrhea volume they're having. So it really is important that we know that they're having a liter or a liter and a half or two liters versus a smaller amount. That gives us an idea of how we're doing. So in this scenario, he's had a lot of diarrhea and abdominal cramping. Again, we've got infectious workup that's negative, and he has a colon biopsy that's consistent with graft-versus-host disease. Lower acute graft versus, GI graft-versus-host disease, again, typically occurs within the first 100 days post-transplant, but this is a form of GVHD that can occur much later, sometimes at the time of uh, tapering of immune suppression. And in this instance, we're talking about the small intestine and the colon, usually in a continuous sort of involvement. So it's not one spot. It's really happening throughout the mucosa of the, uh, of the uh, bowel. We, again, we have to think about infectious problems, particularly CMV infection, uh, bacterial infection, C. diff, and there's always medications uh, that we have to consider. Now, this is a type of graft-versus-host disease where the response to therapy and the tempo of response is much more variable. Again, the primary therapy is high-dose steroids, but it's often necessary to add other agents into the mix in an effort to uh, achieve the optimal response. And the other point is that unlike upper GI graft-versus-host disease, which typically responds very quickly, this is the kind of graft-versus-host disease where patients can oftentimes be hospitalized for a period of weeks and even months um, because of the need for IV medications, IV, um, uh, IV feedings, and, um, uh, and gut rest. There's, and with that, because of the breakdown of that mucosal barrier in the colon, uh, there's a very high risk of uh, secondary infections and bleeding. So these are patients that have a high burden of symptoms, uh, but also a, a, a high burden in terms of, of the danger of the graft-versus-host disease and the, uh, and the results of the uh, uh, immunosuppression. Now, Moving on to later post-transplant and talking about chronic graft-versus-host disease and other syndromes that occur later after the transplant. Again, we've got our 40-year-old man, but now he's 200 days after um, allogeneic transplant. He had acute graft-versus-host disease, which was treated with steroids, but the steroids have now been tapered off. And he comes into clinic complaining of food sticking in his chest and the inability to, fo- to swallow. He's got some other skin changes associated with chronic graft-versus-host disease that aren't very severe. And his upper um, endoscopy reveals esophageal stricture. And this is chronic graft-versus-host disease of the esophagus. And there really are sort of two general forms uh, in which this can take. The first is when there is focal scarring, which if it occurs very, very focally, we call it a ring. If it occurs across a little bit of a longer distance, we call it a stricture. But it's a narrowing that physically obstructs food and pills and other things from going down and oftentimes is associated with other kinds of symptoms like esophageal spasm and things. The other syndrome that can occur as a consequence of the scarring of the esophagus is something called achalasia, which really amounts to the fact that, you know, the esophagus is not just a tube. It's a tube that actually has nerve endings that result in actual motility through the esophagus, and when it gets really scarred down, that motility stops and things get just kind of sit there and oftentimes um, uh, cause pain, spasms, and sometimes regurgitation. Now, for this type of graft-versus-host disease, in and of itself, the treatment is usually, there may be some some minor uh, immunosuppressive changes that need to be made, but the treatment here is typically physical. It's dilatation of the esophagus with, with, through endoscopy with a series of what we call dilators, which literally physically break up the strictures so that things can uh, go down. The other point to make is that 
it's often necessary for people to change their diet, to, to, to change the consistency of the food that they eat so that it goes down more, uh, more easily. All right, so we're back to our 40-year-old guy. He's a couple of hundred days out from his transplant. Again, he's had the acute graft-versus-host disease, which is resolved, and uh, he's been tapered off of his immune suppression. And now he has the development of very gradual but progressive weight loss, despite the fact that he's eating very well. And this is kind of a sleeper sort of um, scenario that we see all too often. Unexplained weight loss after transplantation in the face of really good caloric intake. And there really are two main causes that can result in this same syndrome. One is physical graft-versus-host disease involving the small bowel resulting in malabsorption, but the other is pancreatic insufficiency. So the pancreas, it turns out, makes enzymes that help us to um, absorb nutrients, and if the pancreas um, uh, becomes inflamed and loses its ability to make those enzymes, then you get malabsorption as well without a problem in the actual gut mucosa. Whether or not that pancreatic insufficiency is actually graft-versus-host disease is a little bit more of a debatable topic, but regardless, both of these syndromes occur in, in the allogeneic transplant settings, and they both present very similarly with usually increased bowel movements, sometimes oily or floating stools, but the treatment is different. So the treatment of small bowel GVHD is to increase the immunosuppression. The treatment of pancreatic insufficiency is to replace the enzymes. So it's actually really important to make the distinction, to make the diagnosis, which is typically done by doing a small bowel um, uh, capsule study and, and uh, taking biopsies. All right, we're back to our same friend, our 40-year-old guy, and he's now a couple, 250 days out from allogeneic transplantation. Again, had some acute graft-versus-host disease, and he's recently been tapered off of his steroids. And he comes in with, the, with voluminous diarrhea, abdominal pain. He's having some GI bleeding and generalized weakness. The infectious evaluation is negative, and colonoscopy shows a da badly damaged colonic mucosa and a biopsy consistent with severe acute graft-versus-host disease. So this is the same scenario, really, as we saw in this same patient before day 100, but the difference here is at day 50, he's at the transplant center. At day 250, he's at home. And so he's at home, he's with his primary physician, maybe it takes a little bit longer for everything to be figured out, but the important point here is this is a person that needs to be back at the transplant center because he's probably going to require some degree of hospital, period of hospitalization and uh, acute intervention. So. What other kinds of things cause GI disturbance? And I think it's important to point out that everything is not graft-versus-host disease, and in fact, at least a third, if not more, of GI disturbance after the period of chemotherapy-related um, GI disturbance is worn off, at least... A, at least a third of patients have something other than graft-versus-host disease, whether it's infection, um, the effects of prolonged gut rest, gastritis, acid reflux, medications, and diet. Um, and, and I'll just pause for a moment to make a comment about diet. I think that after people have transplant, they sometimes think that they can just jump back into their normal diet, eating the things that they ate before um, they had their transplant, and that may not be the case. And I think in particular, um, people oftentimes for a period of time lose their ability to digest milk products, um, so they become lactose intolerant. People also often become fat intolerant, so things like fatty fried foods, um, uh, become a problem. So I, I don't advise that people jump into a pepperoni pizza <laughs> right after uh, uh, after they have their transplant. But I think the important thing is that you have to listen to your body as far as um, uh, what things you're not tolerating and avoid those things and periodically rechallenge. But 
don't keep eating the pepperoni pizza if it's uh, uh, messing up the gut. So just a few words about management, and the, the, the key principles here are, you know, we try to keep the gut doing something uh, rather than not using it. But, again, dairy products, fiber, and fried foods um, are hard for the damaged gut to, to handle. So as we're refeeding somebody with um, after they've had gut graft versus host disease, we start very bland, kind of the way that you would feed your child, you know, with a brat type diet uh, after they've had a, a GI illness. Um, in terms of active management, the immune suppressive therapy, um, there are a variety of different uh, agents that can be used. And again, a part of how we decide about those agents depends on what's going on, where we are post-transplant, where the, where the patient is geographically, whether, you know, in terms of uh, 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 proximity to the transplant centers because some of these things require either monitoring or regular attendance at the transplant center. Things like photophoresis, you have to go in a couple of times per week in order to get it, so that's not going to be very practical for someone that lives far away. I'm just going to finish with a couple of uh, exciting new uh, agents that we're looking at in the area of graft-versus-host disease. Um, ibrutinib is an oral uh, inhibitor of the brutin tyrosine kinase, which is a B-cell signaling molecule. This is a drug that's FDA approved for a variety of different B-cell malignancies, but it is also clearly active in um, uh, chronic graft-versus-host disease. There's some very exciting preliminary data that were presented at the last hematology um, national meeting um, uh, in December. Uh, showing a very high proportion of patients achieving responses which tended to be durable. And so we're now actually participating in a, a large uh, multi-center uh, randomized trial looking at ibrutinib as part of initial treatment in co with, for chronic graft-versus-host disease where patients are randomized to either steroid, steroids with or without ibrutinib. Another agent that we're very excited about is ruxolitinib or Jacophy, and this is an oral inhibitor of a signaling uh, inflammatory molecule called, uh, or two molecules, JAK1 and JAK2. Um, this is a drug that is uh, FDA approved for the treatment of a myeloproliferative neoplasm called myelofibrosis. But this is another drug that through its anti-inflammatory uh, uh, effect is able to get graft-versus-host disease um, uh, controlled in a fairly uh, high proportion of patients. And it really, more than anything, I think, acts as a steroid-sparing and steroid-supplementing agent um, with responses that tend to be quite durable. And this, again, is currently being studied prospectively in both acute and chronic uh, graft-versus-host disease uh, in combination with steroids. So just to finish up, GI problems, as you all know, are common after transplant, almost universal. Um, GVHD is one of many causes. Um, the solution to the graft-versus-host disease really depends upon the anatomic site, but steroids are generally the mainstay of management. There's no one easy answer for patients with late graft-versus-host disease, but there certainly are promising uh, agents and approaches uh, on the horizon. We, we need the uh, FDA to understand, and I think they do understand, that this is truly an area of unmet need um, uh, so that we can uh, get these agents uh, uh, quickly evaluated uh, for our patients. So with that, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions from you. Questions? We have one. Good morning, doctor. Uh, if you've had an esophageal stricture, uh, do they tend to reoccur? That's a great question. So um, they do tend to recur, and oftentimes patients will need a whole series of dilatations um, in order to really truly open things up. Um, most of the time, once things really mechanically get opened up, it doesn't have to be a frequent occurrence, but oftentimes you'll have a series of dilatations over a short period of time to kind of get things open up, and there may be, have to be periodic, I'll call them tune-ups. Yes, sir. 
I have, um, I've had three different rounds of battling CMV, and um, it just doesn't seem to go away. And then at the same time, I have, you know, a mild, I'm 200, 200 plus days out, mm -hmm. um, um, draft versus host, and it's diagnosed with, with scoping. So I, I know I have it. But, you know, does it make sense? Or what we're doing right now is just treating both because it's not clear as to which is causing the the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, is that a common kind of thing and you just kind of write it out? So that, you know, I think this brings up um, an important point, and that is that graft-versus-host disease and the management of graft-versus-host disease create a level of immune incompetence such that people tend to get um, infections, and these are opportunistic infections, as we call them, meaning they're, they're infections with organisms that normal people don't have a problem with. CMV or cytomegalovirus is one of those infections, and actually the most common one that we see in patients with graft-versus-host disease. So the scenario that you are in is absolutely a very common uh, one. And it's a balancing act. So we want to treat the graft versus host disease, but at the same time, we want to minimize the amount of immune suppression that we use to do that um, so that your immune system can take care of the CMV. Because we can throw all the antiviral drugs that we want uh, at the CMV, but you need your immune system to give that extra push. So it really is a balancing act uh, between the CMV medicine and the immune suppression. And it's just a tough situation, but one that hopefully you will navigate your way through because as you get farther and farther out from the transplant, the normal aspects of your immune system should start to really kick in. Hi. Um, is over-the-counter medication good for, uh, like, upset stomach and the diarrhea, you know, that comes along, other than starting a regimen of medications? That's what my doctor has me on, anyway. Mm -hmm. So for people that have chronic diarrhea, um, Imodium um, can certainly be used. Um, if it is, but, it, but again, there are lots of different reasons that people may have um, uh, diarrhea or upset stomach, and certainly the first thing that we try is over-the-counter medicines. But if there is real graft-versus-host disease going on, then that's not going to be a permanent fix. Hi, um, I'm about two and a half years out, and I suffer from the graft-versus-host of the gut. Um, I've on budesonide, and I've mm -hmm. tried to taper. Um, I tried to get off of it about six times. I'm on my seventh try right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going up and well. down. It's been really, really slowly this time, but um, it's working, I think. So, but my question was, um, your comment said um, that it can present, and, and I'm still on Tacro. Mm -hmm. So you said that that it could present uh, any time after disc discontinuation of the immunosuppressant. So, are you, is that like after I'm off Tacro, it can perhaps come back again, or in theory, it could. Yeah. In theory, it could. And, and your scenario is one where I think it's going to be a, very, a slow, careful, supervised process of coming off the, the tacrolimus once you have come off the budesonide. Yeah. Okay. But we generally sequence that so that people usually, but not always, get completely off the steroid before we tackle trying yeah, to come my, off. Yeah, my doctor said about six months or so after I, once I get off of it to start talking right. about the tap room. Mm -hmm. Can I go? Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, um, I've had um, GHB of the esophagus okay. and the stricture tightening. Mm -hmm. It started about three, four years post my transplant, mm -hmm. and initially I had frequent dilatation, but I kind of got tired and I was afraid they may mm -hmm. puncture my esophagus or something because that's one of the side effects, you know, the, mm -hmm. co the complication. So I stopped doing it and I'm 20 years out now, but I've just kind of learned to modify my diet. I can't mm -hmm. take pills. I take liquid pills. But my question to you is now that I'm so far out, mm 
and a lot of my GVHD symptoms have resolved, will it be beneficial for me to see if I can get it stretched? You know, that, that's <laughs> ha certainly hard to say. It sounds like you have uh, weathered the test of time, <laughs> um, but I think it might be worth a trip to the GI specialist to, to see if at this point you could get a more durable opening of the esophagus. I think she'd like to ask a follow-up. It, um, um, it really doesn't bother me too much, but it just makes for eating in social gathering difficult because mm -hmm. I have to be close to the bathroom. If I swallow something that's bigger oh. than a pea size, I have to find my way to the bathroom and get it out. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, and then I'm sure the older I get with the normal swallowing problems, it mm -hmm. may get worse. I'm just kind of thinking, maybe I need to check it out and see if they can dilate it again a couple of times. I would. All right. Back there. Yep, yes, sir. In June, I'll be um, six years out, and um, one of the things that I've experienced since my transplant is um, a lot of gas all the time. Sometimes it just happens, it'll bother me all day. Sometimes it'll go away, but sometimes it'll just remain all day. Is that common, and um, what can we do to help that? So, have you tried over the counter things like Gas X and I have, and, and they haven't worked. My um, doctor just prescribed me a probiotic. I haven't gotten it yet. Um, I'm mm -hmm. going to get it soon. But right. all of the things like gas sex and um, I think it was something called Bueno or something like that. Yeah, Bino. Or Bino. Or, mm -hmm. I combined them together, but it still didn't help. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like it very well could be that, you know, we all have colonization of our guts with normal bacteria that sort of protect us against, um, uh, against bad bacteria. And sometimes that environment gets disturbed. Um, and so I think the idea of trying um, uh, probiotic is a really good one um, to try to sort of almost reset the bacterial clock in your gut because that can certainly be a cause of uh, excess gas. But that that is a not uncommon complaint among people even who don't have necessarily have overt graft versus host disease. Thank you. Um, hi, this is one of the gross questions, but um, there is no gross <laughs> question. <laughs> anyway, I have a real healthy intake. And then I have like about two or three really large kind of like cow poops a day. So as far as losing weight, it's not a matter of losing weight, but certainly I'm probably 20 pounds under since the transplant two and a half years ago. And there's also a sense of urgency, but not dramatic. So I can control it and be out in situations. However, I've never pooped so much in my life. And is it... Um, it, 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 it's not diarrhea, it's just like how, it, is it a malabsorption or is it a pancreas enzyme situation, you think? So hard to say because, again, um, as, as I tried to point out, those things can seem a lot the same. Um, they present in sort of the same way, and it sounds to me like if you're not losing a lot of weight, you know, you, you certainly could empirically try pancreatic enzymes and see if that changes the, um, uh, the flavor of the, the, the bowel movements. Uh, but that may just be your new normal. Did you have graft-versus-host disease of the gut or a lot of uh, GI toxicity from the chemotherapy? No, I really didn't. Okay. Well, you could certainly empirically try pancreatic enzyme supplementation. It's easy to do. They, you know, you just take them orally um, and, and see if that, if anything changes. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, yes. Thank you for um, such an important talk. Um, I was diagnosed with acute GI, GBH, when I was still in uh, transplant, and um, and it's just continued. Uh, I'm three years out, and I'm um, still on serolimus and ruxolitinib, mm -hmm. and um, I was just hospitalized this week for GI, GBH. 
So it's just, it's, it's an ongoing problem. Is it safe to take probiotics in active culture uh, as an immune compromised person? Um, and would there be a benefit? Um, so that's actually a great question um, because there is a fair amount of evidence that is emerging that there's a relationship between dysregulation of the microorganisms in the gut and graft-versus-host disease in the maintenance of graft-versus-host disease. Um, in your particular case, given that I don't know the particulars of exactly, you know, what's going on with your gut, um, I, I don't want to tell you that it is or it isn't safe, but I think it's a very valid question for you to ask your doctor um, because depend if, if your mucosa is basically intact, then it probably is safe and it might be beneficial in terms of, again, trying to reset that biologic clock inside of your gut and uh, get, break the cycle of inflammation. Thank you. Yep, over here. Um, can you give any suggestions as far as like what to use for a probiotic? Uh, with my, I had a lot of GBHD. I'm six years out with my transplant, so I had some bathroom issues already, and then I wound up with a staph infection in one leg, and a month later in the other leg. So it was a lot of steroids yeah, and clindamycin, which I think really is a bad one. Yeah. <laughs> and my oncologist is very reluctant to have me do anything. Like he just wants me breathing. And any comfort or quality of life is really just not on his radar. Uh, and I can understand and appreciate like what the other woman asked about as far as, you know, he doesn't want to introduce bacteria and mm -hmm. things, but I'm not, you know, my neutrophils and all those counts are pretty good, you know, relatively speaking. So I would like to, you know, maybe try something as far as a probiotic that could help. They just uh, had me taking FiberCon and then they suggested taking Imodium mm -hmm. on an extended basis, which I've tried, and it helps, but it really just kind of delays the problem. It doesn't fix it mm -hmm. and just kind of gives me a general feeling of uneasiness. So I'd rather try to fix the problem a little more, and if probiotics could do that, but I wouldn't know where to start. It's, I don't want to waste my money on mm -hmm. Activia if you say that's garbage. Or Well, I might start with something like Activia because I think in the – in terms of the level of potential harm, there's probably less harm there than with some of the more concentrated probiotics. But I think you, if, and if you see improvement with that, then you could sort of almost graduate to something that's a little bit more intensive in terms of the, of the pills. But I, I you know, it, it's always a, a fine balance in people that have ongoing um, graft versus host disease of the gut because of the issue of it's not so much the neutrophils and the immune system, but if the barrier function is at all disrupted, um, then that can lead to issues. But I, I think starting with something like Activia or another act, yogurt with active cultures is a good place to start. And I think you'll know whether it, if, it, if it has an effect, then... Okay, because some of the stuff I read, you know, they... I don't know what to trust, but they said, if, you know, the yogurt doesn't really have a high enough concentration or if it's the initial stomach acid, even if it has a certain, you know, X percentage or certain quantity of the probiotics in it, it's not actually making its way through far enough in your system to make it, a difference. I mean, it is true that the, the probiotic pills that you can buy at, you know, GNC or wherever um, have a higher concentration, but that, that also potentially for somebody who has a broken gut may, may be a, a more risky proposition. So, again, I would start with the less concentrated, and you can always graduate forward. Okay, and the clindamycin, do you think that could have, you know, they wouldn't specifically say if that exacerbated my issue or not. I kind of thought maybe that would have wiped well, out well, the flora or well, whatever. Well, clindamycin, problem. because of its effects on anaerobic bacteria, which are some of the effect the uh, – uh, protective um, uh, commensals in our gut, it is a particularly difficult one in terms of, of changing the flora. Um, you were tested, I assume, for C. diff. Uh, 
Okay, and, and it's not that. But it still screws up that balance in terms of the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria, and it can take a while to get that reset. Are there other questions? In the back. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Dr. Langston. Um, I had a, I've been through multiple endoscopies and uh, kind of left off before the camera endoscopy. The GI specialist that I saw suggested that based on what he saw, camera endoscopy probably wouldn't necessarily provide any useful information. Uh, and, but this is the first time I've heard any kind of mention of the possibility of pancreatic insufficiency. Um, I'm curious, is there, other than a camera endoscopy or that kind of thing, are there any other factors or diagnostic criteria that might in indicate uh, that that might be a thing? So the pancreatic insufficiency isn't diagnosed by any kind of uh, endoscopy. Um, so really the, the sort of simplest way to test is to empirically give pancreatic enzymes. We can, um, you know, there are sophisticated ways that those things can be measured, but it's easier to just have a trial of supplementation and um, uh, assess whether that provides a change um, uh, in your symptoms. Thank you. Other questions? And, and that, and that the, the pancreatic insufficiency, I think, is an too often overlooked possibility. And again, whether or not it relates to the graft versus host disease or whether it's an effect of some of the immune suppressive and other medicines is a little bit up for, for debate. But it definitely occurs, particularly after allotransplantation. transplantation. Yes, doctor, with um, things like um, lactose intolerance or oily stools, is that dose dependent in terms of it? Can you get away with it a little bit or do you need to prepare for it before you eat any anything with milk products or or even fatty things are seem to be particularly bad? Um, well, so good question. Um, you know, and, and the answer is that you probably start out, you know, the cells that have lactase are the first to die and the last to come back. Um, can you get away with a little bit of milk products, a little bit of fatty food? Probably. Um, and, you know, it becomes sort of a trial and error thing. Maybe you can get away with some milk in your coffee and maybe then a few weeks later you can graduate to you know, something a little bit more involved, you know, cheese on your sandwich. Um, uh, so it, it is a continuum. In it's not a, it's there or it isn't there. But it's a matter of you don't have the same number of cells. And you might never, with a damaged gut, you might never um, have the normal number of those cells uh, present in the gut. So it might be a long-term dietary adaptation that you have to make. Isn't there a test for malabsorption? Uh, yes. Um, they quantitate. There, there are sophisticated tests where they give you something that you eat or drink, and then they measure it in your stool. So, yes, the GI specialists do do testing for malabsorption. We have time for one more. These have been great questions, really good questions. Okay. Well, Dr. Langston, thank you very much for your presentation and taking time to talk.